Hi, everyone, and welcome to the week ahead. My name is Tony Nash. Uh, today, we're joined by Harris Cooperman. You may, may know him as Cuppy on Twitter. Uh, we've also got Brent Johnson and Tracy Shukart. Uh, uh, Cuppy is with Praetorian Capital. Uh, Brent Johnson, of course, is with Santiago Capital. And Tracy Shukart is with Hightower Resource Advisors. So guys, thank you so much for joining us. I think this is gonna be a great discussion. Hi everyone, wanted to let you know about a promo we're having for our CI Futures subscription product. This is our inflation buster sale. We know that prices are hitting you everywhere and it's holiday time. So I want to give you a, a big break on our CI Futures product. CI Futures has thousands of assets that we forecast every month. We do commodities, currencies, and equity indices every single week on Monday morning. There are hundreds, almost 800 of those that we forecast every week, updated on Monday morning. We forecast economics variables every month. Those are available on the first of every month. In total, it's thousands of assets. We show our error. We are the only product out there, the only forecasting product out there that actually discloses our error. You can see our historical error and you can see a year's forecast at monthly intervals. Right now we're offering 50% off of CI Futures. You can actually get it for as low as $25 a month. Uh, we have different arrangements based on the commitment you want, a full year or say going month to month. So you can get it anywhere between $25 a month and $50 a month uh, with our current offering. So please check it out. Please click on the site. If you need a demo, let us know. Thanks very much. Um, we have some key themes here. The first, uh, really looking at some of Cuppy's uh, discussions lately, uh, looking at $300 crude and kind of still with a question mark, uh, bullish housing. I think that's the first thing we're going to jump into. Then we're going to look at Japan's normalization. We had some news this week with uh, BOJ uh, chair kind of starting to normalize the Japanese uh, money supply environment. So we'll uh, jump into that with Brent. Um, and then we're going to look at recession and oil demand elasticity uh, with Tracy. So guys, thanks again for, for joining us. I'm looking forward to just a great discussion today. Um, so Cuppy, um, you know, you have posted quite a lot about $300 oil in your newsletter and online. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of, we had a show last week that was full of oil bulls. Uh, I don't know that anybody had particularly said $300. So um, I'm really curious about your $300 call. Can you walk through your thesis and just help us understand what you're thinking? Yeah, sure. I mean, Overall, oil is just like all other commodities. It's supply and demand. And uh, since uh, 2014, no one's really invested. And the supply side is really constricted. You have ESG mandates, you have lack of capital from uh, you know, institutional investors, you have banks that won't lend, you have governments around the world that are canceling pipelines and canceling permits. And you now you have the UK talking about excess profits taxes. I mean, that, that, that's not an environment for guys to go uh, explore and drill. And the thing about oil is that if you're not drilling new wells, they, they, they decline over time. And so the question keeps being, where does the oil come from? People yep. just think that, you know, the U.S. shale, you can flip a switch and barrels show up. And maybe that was the case a decade ago, but that's not how it works anymore. We, we've really hit the, the best acreage. And from here on out, uh, not only are you working mostly at uh, tier two locations, but you've seen massive inflation in terms of oil field services. And those wells that everyone used to lie about and say it had 100 IRRs at 60, what we learned is they don't break even at 60. And now you have massive oil field inflation. Uh, I don't know if you have decent IRRs at 80 or maybe even 100 in, in a lot of these places. And I mean, it, it's no secret why no one's drilling. The numbers don't work. Um, and then, you know, you flip it to the other side on the demand side. Look, uh, 6 billion people want the same standard of living and, and the same energy per capita utilization that all of us have. And, you know, you could have said this decades ago, but, but what's changed is that they're all on that part of the S curve where their per capita consumption explodes. I mean, look what's happened in India. We're having, I guess, a global recession this year, but demand is up teens. Uh, you look all around the world, you know, Africa, LATAM, I mean, demand is up. Even in the US, demand is up. And so, you know, demand grows 
one or two million barrels every year. And where is the supply going to come from? Uh, what we've seen, like, like I said, is the supply is restricted. And even if you, you know, try to add supply, it takes a couple of years. And so I think you're going to have a massive uh, a mismatch. And what, what's hidden that for the last year is that China's been offline. That's two or three million barrels. Uh, the SPR is globally of about a million, million five. So, you know, you, you're really looking at, uh, let's call it four and a half million barrels that, that, that's been kind of like uh, subsidizing the balances. And, you know, you could debate, you know, exactly what the number is and it moves around some. But for the most part, you've had this weird subsidy to the oil price. And I don't think that's going to be there next year. China has been pretty clear they're opening and the SPR is empty. Meanwhile, Russian uh, production is in free fall after the U.S. firms left. That's another million. And like I said, the global demand grows a million or two a year. And I don't think we're going to see much growth on the supply side. I think you're going to have a five, four to five million barrel deficit. And, you know, that, that's going to be one of the biggest deficits in 40 years. And, you know, it may even be as large as we saw in World War II. You know, it's a percentage of total uh, consumption. And I, I think the price is going to scream out of control. I don't, I don't think 300 is the clearing price long term. But I think, you know, you could get there in, in a super spike, especially given how much structured products out there that's synthetically sure. So that, that's how I see it, and that's why I'm so bullish. Okay. So um, is your time frame for 23 for the $300 price, or is that just kind of a, a longer-term target? I think it's like the next year or two. Okay. I mean, like I said, we're, we're going to have massive uh, supply-demand mismatch next year, and I think it's going to scream out of control. There's some things we could still do. Uh, you, you know, They're going to jump some more SPR maybe. There's some things around the margin they can do. But in the end, if you're structurally short oil and there's – no oil to be had. I think the price goes crazy. And, you know, you always have a geopolitical kind of like upside uh, there to whatever happens to the price of oil. Cause you know, it's never really the downside, but it's usually the upside if something crazy happens. Right. Okay. We just, um, we just had Zelensky speak to us Congress this week here in the U S and it doesn't really sound like, like the, the war there is slowing down. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I don't know that we get a clear picture anyway. But if uh, I think there are a lot of assumptions that that will calm down next year for for some of these guys who aren't seeing super high oil prices, if if that war intensifies, does that speed up your three hundred dollar uh, price target, or does it affect it at all? I don't think it affects it at all. I mean, Russian oil is still making its way to the market, but uh, U.S. technology for the Russian oil fields isn't. And so, you know, Russia is going to be in slow motion decline in terms of production. And I don't really see what we would change uh, in, in the Ukraine, you know, situation. Um, you know, I, I think it's very likely that as soon as the ground freezes there, those half million conscripts will be set loose behind the Ukrainian army and kind of surround them all. Uh, you know, the, the only reason that Ukraine's still in the war is really just because it's been kind of warm there. Uh, I mean, I think it doesn't look very good, but that, that's like more of a personal view. But I don't think it really sure. matters who wins this war. Right. Um, you know, in the end, Russian production's rolling over. Right. OK. And is there a possibility of, let's say, um, uh, a load of investment going into Venezuela in the short term and, you know, that volume, that supply hitting markets to save markets? I'm just trying to kind of figure out, is there a, is there a supply side, near term supply side solution? Not really. I mean, who wants to invest in Venezuela? You can get a bunch <laughs> of pieces of paper with guarantees, but right. like, like, I mean, the, the history of Chevron does, of course. But. No, it, but it's absolutely true. I mean, it would take billions and it's still, the problem is geology there and what's going on. And Explain that. When you say the problem is geology, what is- It's what not is only their infrastructure, which is decrepit after years right. of corruption, but it's also geology, right? They have very sludgy oil. It's very hard to get out of the ground. Okay. Uh, so even with investments, you're facing an additional challenge of the geology there being very, very difficult. And so that's just going to add. So anybody thinking that Venezuela oil is going to change this dynamic is off base, in my opinion. OK. And then Africa supplies, other stuff. There, there Brazil, there, there isn't really anything that can be accelerated on the supply side. I'm just trying to poke well, holes in this, guys, just to, just to get a better view. I mean, I think you're going to see an increase in offshore oil production around the middle of this decade. You know, Guyana, Suriname, West Africa, Brazil. It's all coming online, but it doesn't come online fast. Right. Well, you have a lot of places that are rolling over or really struggling just to stand in place. 
I think we should look at is what's happening in Saudi, where they're frantically procuring every jackup that could be had globally. They're going uh, off into the Gulf. I mean, if their oil production was stable or they thought they had more onshore, which is the cheap stuff, they'd just be drilling more onshore. The fact that they're going into the Gulf, it's an increase in complexity and cost means that their you know, existing fields are now getting old. And I mean, it's, it's obvious they're old. They've been going for 70 years. Yep. And, but but they, they're finally seeing that water cut really pick up and they're, they're starting to panic. Um, no, I, I think you have a lot of problems everywhere. Plus you have some swing places, Iraq, Libya, maybe Kazakhstan gets cut off again from exports. You have a bunch of places where, you know, you could lose a million barrels in a hurry. Okay. No, it's, it's, it sounds pretty ominous actually. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, trying to find ways to, to push back on that, but I, you know, again, we had some, some really smart folks last week, including Tracy, who had a similar thesis, maybe not 300, but a similar thesis. And I think what you're saying, Cuppy, makes a lot of sense. So I think the pushback is really that something could happen on the demand side, where you have a global economic crisis, they lock us down for monkeypox mm -hmm. or the next pox they invent. You know, like it, it, something like that is what I'd be looking at uh, in terms of the wild card, where you know demand That's... falls off. But all it really does is postpone things. I mean, look, it's December. Uh, 2023 budgets are being set at all the majors, and they're being set in a context of mid 70s WTI. Do you think mm -hmm. a board of directors are going to approve an increase in spending? Like, I think 2023 and as a result, 24 production, at least, you know, uh, onshore U.S. is kind of baked in the cake based on the 75 price today. Yep. Hey, Tony, I was just, uh, you know, I, I, I typically would defer and I will defer on all things oil to, to Cuppy and Tracy. Um, but I would say that, you know, to, to be completely truthful, I actually shorted a little bit of oil this morning. And it's okay. just a tactical thing. It's not a huge deal. If it goes against me, we'll stop out and it'll be fine. But what Cuppy just said, I think could have, and the interesting thing is if we do, I think it's possible we do get this demand shock, right? And we get some kind of a global slowdown in the first half, which could potentially push oil a little bit lower. But if that were to happen, I would then, well, I already do agree with Cuppy's, you know, thesis kind of medium to longer term. I think he's kind of nailed the overall structural issues and why it is. And I would just say that if, if we do get kind of a short-term demand drop that pushes the price lower, that could actually help to, 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 to cut supply even more because firms go bankrupt or they can't, you know, invest or whatever it is. And then it constricts supply even more. And then that's how, and then you get a military action. And that's how, in my opinion, that's how you get oil at 200 bucks or 300 bucks. Well, so, and, and so, so I, I tend to agree with the uh, company's uh, overall position. You're just talking about the slingshot, Brent. The yeah, I'm, ex that's exactly that's exactly right. That's exactly Absolutely. right. Absolutely. And you have to realize that if we have the lower oil prices we have and gasoline prices we have, that increases demand exactly. in, yeah. in a supply side constricting yeah. environment. So that's where you get your slingshot. So it really yeah. depends on, uh, I think, how you're trading this. That definitely depends on your time frame. If you're yeah. longer term, that's one thing. If you're shorter term, I think oil is going to be volatile, um, you know, for the next few quarters. So because we're actually talking about $300 oil, I think it's City who always do, does the extremes in crude. So now we're going to have a City report that says $500 oil, right? <laughs> so, um, So, Cubby, you you also had a, a very interesting call on housing. And when I send out the tweet about this uh, recording, um, uh, I had some questions about your your housing call, your bullish housing call. And I, I want to ask, are you still bullish housing? And can you go into that thesis a little bit either way? What what are you what's your thinking on on U.S. housing now? So I'm bullish U.S. housing. Um... You know, structurally, you have a shortage of 5 million homes. This is, you know, population growth, especially people my age, a little younger, that are starting families and they need homes. 
And there's been a lot of migration in the U.S. And so you need a lot of homes in Texas and Tennessee and Florida and not where these people are fleeing from. Um, and so as a result, there's just strong demand for homes. At the same time, if you take mortgages up to 7%, no one can afford a home. And so we're having a bit of a pause as uh, the Federal Reserve kind of intercedes in the housing market. And it's kind of like a Brent slingshot in oil. All you're going to do is make the problem worse if you're you know, not building enough homes for the demand because uh, the demand keeps growing. So the population keeps growing. And right. so, you know, they, they, they've kind of postponed this a little. You've seen rents spike out of control, though that's kind of stabilizing a little just with the economy kind of slowing. But no, I think you, the, the, the housing market's going to do very well, but it's going to need a pause on interest rates or an acceleration on inflation. I mean, you could look at a lot of emerging markets where, you know, you can't borrow for 30 years. You can't maybe get five years and you're going to pay 15 percent interest rate on that. But you know what? They're having huge uh, demand for housing because, you know, if inflation's 20 and you fund it at 15 and, you know, you get put, put a couple of turns of debt on that, well, you're making 20, 30 percent on your equity. That's a good place to be as a 25 year old guy or 30 year old guy with a family trying to get a home. Yeah. When uh, people don't, don't understand why real estate is so attractive in Asia and why, say, Hong Kong homes or Chinese homes or whatever, why you always have this inflationary environment in real estate in Asia. What you talked about, Kavi, is exactly why. I think it's very hard for people in the U.S. particularly to understand why real estate in Asia is so appealing. And it's exactly for that reason. Yeah, LATAM in Africa, too, where interest rates are high, but you know you still have a, a positive real yield on owning your property because it's depreciating. I think the other thing I'd say in the U.S., and, and I think people kind of lost the narrative here, guys are complaining that you know when when uh, you know their parents, like my parents, were buying homes, it used to cost two or three years of salary, and now it's eight years or ten years of salary, and they say homes are really expensive. Yes, homes are really expensive, but you know the guys got buying a, a McMansion today. It's like a four thousand square foot home in the suburbs. If you look at what the people were buying in the seventies and eighties, it was like twelve hundred square feet, and it was a two bedroom with a little kitchen. Now the kitchen has two hundred thousand dollars of appliances in it. Like right. the reason these things got really expensive and, and, and unaffordable, I think you'll see some reversion back to a lower uh, price point home with with less amenities because you got to put people into homes. There's nowhere to put them. And so, big picture, I'm super bullish. The, you know, you, you can't go indefinitely uh, with you know having a, a family with three kids and they're in a two bedroom that's you know twelve hundred square feet. They they need space. But that's, that's going to take until rates come back. And as soon as uh, rates peak out and start dropping, or when inflation uh, accelerates again, uh, I'm going to be all over housing. Great. Okay, that's good. Thanks for that clarification. Um, I think that's that's really interesting. But in the near term, you're not you're not necessarily bullish on housing in the near term while, while rates are rising. I think housing is going to do just fine because the, the tailwinds are so strong. But at, at the same time, I think there's better stuff to own. I'd much rather be in things that are pro-inflation. Uh, I really just want to stick with uh, energy, uranium. I think those are trends that do well, uh, really in either uh, market uh, environment. But you know, just because of the supply demand uh, imbalances over the next year or two, I think they just work uh, idiosyncratically no matter what. And I don't know, I, I just think it's easier trades. Great, okay. We did have some questions actually about emerging markets. So I just want to ask you first, Covey, but then the rest of you guys. What emerging markets are you looking at and, and why? I'm not really looking at any, so I, I can't say. I, I will say I have a lot of friends that uh, specialize in emerging markets, and they could show me a bunch of metrics that say emerging markets haven't been this cheap in a very long time on cash flow, uh, book value, dividend, you know, and th th there's some reasons why maybe they deserve to be cheap. But, you know, th 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 those things come and go in terms of the why. But you buy cheap assets, things usually happen to you, uh, you know, that are beneficial over time. I see Brent laughing, so explain. Yeah, I was, well, I, I just, I just, I, I'm not, I'm, okay, to, to, to be clear, I'm not laughing at Cuppy's answer. I, you know, I, I, I tend yeah. to agree with, with, with you know, if, if his friends are telling him these things, I, I'm sure that's true because they tell me the same thing. I just kind of laugh because I feel like every year for the last seven years, the trade of the year at the beginning of the year is to short the dollar and go long EM. It's always the trade. It's always the big idea. And to me, it just never plays out. And I don't think it's going to play out right now. I don't. I personally am not looking at any, any EM other than to stay away from it or perhaps to go on vacation to it. Um, you know, I, I don't want anything to do with it from an investment perspective. Uh, probably not surprisingly, I don't think the move in the dollar is over. And I think, uh, you know, if we get a slowdown in the first half, which I think we will, I think that will play out in the euro dollar market and the emerging markets just as much, if not stronger than it will in the U.S. markets. And so 
Um, okay, you got to do I, I, just don't, I, I don't. I don't see an environment where EM outperforms the United States right now. In dollar terms. In dollar terms. Right. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe in local terms. In local terms, that could easily right. happen. I mean, take a look at Turkey. Right. Right. Tur Turkey stock market has gone up two or three hundred percent in the last eighteen months, but they've got eighty percent inflation in local terms. So. Right. Um, so you have to. So you have to. Yeah. Right. So, Brent, can you talk us through, you mentioned the dollar and, I, you know, everyone always wants to know what your thoughts on the dollar. Can yeah. you walk us through what you're looking for, say, over the next three to six months with the dollar? Yeah. So, I mean, over the next, you know, three to six weeks or a couple of months, I, I don't know, maybe it just go sideways. But I think by, if not the end of Q1, beginning of Q1, kind of April, May timeframe, I think the dollar is much higher than it is right now, because I think that you know, I, I, I sent out a, a tweet earlier today where, because uh, I was kind of laughing, I was talking to somebody and they said, well, rate hikes are over, so the dollar's done. And mm -hmm. I was like, well, the, the dollar can go up for a reason other than rate hikes. And he was like, what are you talking about? And I'm, you know, here's the thing is from 2008 to 2019, the dollar went up 20% and there weren't any rate hikes. I mean, there was a few in 2018. Um, and in 2014, in 2014 and 2015, the DXY went up 25%. There were zero rate hikes. It's because there was a global slowdown, right? And when there's when when dollars aren't circulating and the world needs dollars, there's a dollar shortage, supply demand, it pushes the dollar higher. And so I feel like the move of the dollar in 2020, I'm sorry, in 2022 was all about rate hikes, interest rate differentials, right? And maybe that is potentially over. Uh, but the dollar can move for reasons other than interest rate differentials. And I think people have forgotten that if we go into a recession, or if we go into a global slowdown, all that debt that is issued in dollars still needs to be serviced. And so I think perhaps the, the run in the dollar due to rate hike differentials is, is, is over, uh, but I don't think the run due to dollar shortage due to a global slowdown and, and the need to service dollar debts is over. Now, if I'm wrong, you know, I, I don't think that the Fed will come out and, and totally flip until they're forced to do it. And the only reason they would be forced to do it is if the dollar was higher and all these asset prices were lower. So, you know, is it possible by the end of 2023, the dollar's lower? Sure. But I think at some point in 2023, we're going to get another run in the dollar. And I think it's probably in the kind of the March to April, May timeframe. Well, I think what people also forget is that the Fed has eight plus trillion dollars on its balance sheet. And if they start to sell that off in any sort of volume, that takes dollars out of circulation, right? Yeah. So- right. You know, that's a big assumption because, again, yeah. they're, they're shrinking it on a small basis now. But if they accelerated that, that would take dollars out of circulation. That's bullish dollar as well. Right. Well, and then, you know, the other thing I, I want to make this point because I think this is a critical point. And, and I was speaking to I went to a conference in in uh, October and I'm not going to pick on this conference because it, it's happened at every conference I've gone to. And I had so many people come up and, at me and say, what's going to happen with the Fed? How's the Fed going to get out of this? How's the Fed going to get out of this? They're trapped. Nobody has ever come up and asked me how the ECB is going to get out of it. Yep. Nobody's, <laughs> ever, no, nobody's ever come up and asked me how the Bank of Japan is going to get out of it. Nobody's ever asked me how the Bank of England is going to get out of it. And the thing is, they're in worse shape than we are. I yep. mean, so I hear you and, and I understand all the problems associated with the dollar. Listen, it's a horrible currency. It's just better than the, the other three jokers, you know? Yep. And so... Um, oh, you know, but I gold and that CNY, Brent. I mean, yeah, yeah, gold exactly. and the CNY are going to sell everything. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, my views on the dollar are not just based on what the Fed's going to do. It's a lot of it's based on what these other central banks are going to do, and I just yeah. don't think their leaders are any smarter than ours. Perfect. Um, and and I and I think they're trapped even more than we are. So anyway, not to go off on a whole tangent, but that that's oh. uh, that's why I don't want any have anything to do with emerging markets. That is not a tangent. In fact, that's a segue to our Japan exactly. globalization discussion, right? So right. thanks for that. So, you know, we saw Corona come out, talk about changing policy a little bit and markets reacted with a stronger yen and, you know, yada, yada, right? So is this, a, do you see this as a real change? I see this tweet that you sent out earlier this yeah. week saying, if you think, uh, happen to think today's move in the BOJ is going to work out for Japan, it's not. So can yeah. you talk us through, is it just preparing for the next BOJ J chair to reduce risk if they change policy? Is it a real policy change? Is it going to work out? Well, I, what do you see I, there? I, I don't really think it's a policy change. And, and if you actually look and you know, a lot of people just see the headline and just react and they don't even think about what the headline means. Um, and, and I think the, the market has got into a habit and people in general have got into a habit of reading into it what they want to read into it. 
So I think very much the, the world wants Japan to get out of this and they want the dollar to go down. And so anything that shows that another central bank is going to outperform the dollar, they ultimately want that to be true, whether it is or not. If you read what they actually are doing, they're actually increasing the amount of QE that they're doing. So if you just read that sentence, you'd say, holy cow, the yen's going to go even lower because not only did it have a horrible year this year, but now they're going to increase QE. But at the same time, what they said is that we're going to let the, the, the bond, the yield curve control, the band with which in yield curve control moves, we're going to widen that. So we could have interest rates in Japan go up to 50 basis points rather than 25 basis points. And so the market kind of interpreted that as, okay, they're actually moving towards rate hikes. Now, they didn't say they're moving towards rate hikes. They didn't do a rate hike, but everybody wants to believe that they're going to raise rates. Um, but here's the thing. Earlier this year, in I think it was March or April, interest rates in Japan, because of, because of inflationary pressures, are now actually even hitting Japan. Um, Long-term rates in Japan moved up 25 basis points. And because... The two to five to 10 years prior to that, they were doing QE and negative rates. The central, the, the banking system is chock full. And when I say the banking system, the banks, the hedge funds, the endowments, the, um, all the institutions in Japan have all these zero yielding bonds, Japanese bonds on their banks. And, because, and they're long-term bonds. And so when yields even go up 25 basis points, the convexity makes the balance sheet of all these institutions go upside down. And so... When interest rates went up 25 basis points in April, it caused all kinds of chaos in the Japanese banking system. And the market had to be halted and the Bank of Japan had to come in and promise to do more yield curve control in order to keep it from blowing up. And two days ago or three days ago, whenever that announcement was, they made that announcement. The market took it as an interest rate hike. And guess what happened? They had to halt the Japanese bond market again. So I just... I understand if they do raise rates, that would strengthen the yen. But the problem is, is you cannot, and this is for every country, the U.S. included. Again, there's a progression in how it'll go, but you, you cannot save both the bond market and the currency market because they're, they're, they work at cross purposes. Whatever you do to save the bond market hurts the currency. Whatever you do to save the currency hurts the bond market. And every central bank in history has promised they won't sacrifice the currency. And every central bank in history has ultimately sacrificed the currency. And the reason they always choose the currency over the bond, or the, the reason they always choose to sacrifice the currency over the bond market is two reasons. One, the currency affects the citizens more than the government, and the bond market affects the government more than the citizens. So they're going to bail themselves out before they bail the citizens out. And the second thing is if the bond market blows up and the banking system blows up, there is no longer a distribution system for the, for the government to raise money. So they can't let the bond market blow up because then they can't get money anymore. And then if they can't get money, they can't operate. So this is a very long way of saying that I, I understand why the market moved the way it did. I think maybe in the short term, it makes sense, but in the medium to long term, it doesn't make any sense to me at all. Again, kind of watch what they do, not what they say. I, I think the yen is going much, much lower. Okay, interesting. How long do you think it will take before markets call their bluff? Is that, you know? Maybe a couple months. Really? Again, I, I, okay. I, th I think we're I think we're going to have a lot of problems by the end of Q1 all over okay. the world, not just not just, uh, you know, not just in Japan, not just in the US, not just in Europe, but everywhere. I think we're I think we've been slowly moving towards this crisis. And I think we're, we're almost there. Right. I think a lot of the move in the yen over the past couple of weeks is really just guys uh, degrossing. That was the funding okay. currency for all the risk assets and risk assets went no bid basically yeah. all year. And guys are finally getting redeemed from their hedge funds and, you know, it's year end redemptions. You got to pay it out. It's got to unwind yep. your, you know, your yen to, you know, unwind your Tesla, which is also in free fall. That, that, that <laughs> plays into it as well. That plays into it. Yeah. I see your Tesla Q there. That's a good, good timing. I've had this, uh, what, five years, six years. It's <laughs> finally coming due today. So. Uh, when is it, when is the Twitter two mug, Twitter Q mug coming? I don't know. <laughs> oh, they should have one of those. Shouldn't that's a good idea. Uh -uh. We should start, we should start selling those. I'm a little conflicted here because I feel like Elon might be doing the right thing on the Twitter side, whereas, you know, Tesla's still like the evil empire. So I, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We'll have a, another discussion about that at some point. Brent, you talk about things coming in, in Q1. Can you, can you share a little bit of your thoughts there around markets, potential recession, you know, that line of well, thing? Well, yeah. I mean, in general, you know, it's, it's kind of amazing now. Uh, the, 
let, 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 let's reverse 10 days ago to, to the Fed meeting. At that time, you know, the, the Fed had raised four and a half, almost 4% for the year. And um, markets were down, but they weren't down that much. Now, since then, they've sold off another five or 10%. So now they're, they're, they're getting close to the lows of September again. Um, but, you know, it takes, this is what I think, I think a lot of people are surprised that the market hasn't crashed more than it has based on the four and a half percent or four four percent rate hikes. Um, and I think what sometimes people forget is that we may not even be feeling the effects of the very first rate hike yet, because oftentimes rate hikes take nine months to a year to actually the effects of the rate hike to, sh to you know, sh to show up in the economy and work their way through the economy. Paul I mean, talked about that a lot in his last yeah. press yeah, yeah. right? Well, no, exactly. And the, the first rate hike was nine months ago. It was in March. So it really wasn't that long ago, right? And now they've raised, you know, four times since then. So I just feel like by the time we get into, you know, February, March, that stuff is going to have started to show up, perhaps dramatically. Um, and I think the Fed is going to continue raising until they just can't raise anymore. And so now whether they should or not, whether you believe to Powell or not, again, that's kind of a separate subject. I just think he's going to do it because I think he wants to do it. And he the last thing he wants is for inflation to reaccelerate on his watch. Right. Right. And if he if he crashes the market, then everybody will be begging him to do QE and he can go do QE and be the hero. So yep. I, I, I just kind of see that that's how it's playing. And I think probably a lot of people agree with me on that. I don't think that's any kind of a crazy view right now. I think a lot of people think he's going to hike until until it crashes the economy. Um, but I just, I, I don't see him slowing down until he has to. Brent, I got a question. Yeah. So Lagarde has been super dovish for a very long time, depending which country in the Eurozone, you're at teens, maybe even, you know, high teens inflation. Yeah. All of a sudden last week, she just came out swinging. And, <laughs> she did. And what do you think changed? Like she must, have, like, was, did someone just whisper in her ear? Did she look at a de bad data point? Did a politician be like, Hey, you know, the peasants are upset about the price of Brie. Like what happened? I think it's a little bit of that latter. I mean, and this is, I've talked about this before is that I think we all know that financial repression is the name of the game for governments. That's how they get out of these big debt, you know, these big debts that they, you know, they want to inflate it away over time. The problem though is you know, what they would ultimately like to do is to get very steady rate of inflation at four or 5% a year for, for 10 years, right? And inflate away 50% of the debt. The problem is we've kind of figured out and found out that it's very hard to just get four for four or 5% inflation. It goes from 2% to 12% pretty quickly. They don't have as much control as they think they do, right? And the problem with four or 5% inflation, you can kind of get away with it because it's annoying and it's frustrating, but it's not totally ruining your life. But with 8, 9, 10, 12, 15, 80% inflation, that starts to ruin the, 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 the plebs' lives, as, as you mentioned. And that's when they start to push back from a political perspective. And that's what central banks and you know, governments don't want. They, they don't want the populace you know, revolting. But when you're cold and you're hungry, that's, that's when you revolt. You know, nobody, nobody revolts when they're full and warm and have a great job and are going on vacation. Why would you revolt in that environment? But when things are going against you, and they you push they start pushing back politically, and so I think that the the, the pressures in in Europe are a little bit just too much for them to to not at least acknowledge it publicly. Now, whether they actually do anything and follow through on it, that'll be interesting to see. Because again, ultimately, I think they will save the currency rather than save the bond market. Or I'm sorry, they will save the bond markets rather than save the currency. But uh, I, I do think it's a little bit of of why Lagarde came out as uh, as strong as she did. Do you, think, do you think she follows through or no. she kind of press her? And she I mean, she might, she'll try again. And it's, it's like Powell, Powell will keep trying to, well, eventually the markets will push back on them and won't let them. But I, I think she might try, but I think, I think Europe is just screwed for lack of a better word. So let me ask you guys, are, are we, say US and Europe, are we in a position where we have to approach what Japan is doing where eventually the central bank will come in and buy up equities and they'll buy their own debt and, and this is a cycle that just can't stop. Is that what's going to happen in the U.S. and, and Europe as these central bankers are putting in a put in a quarter? And are we getting closer and closer to kind of D-Day? I, I think we probably are. Now, I, I think what could I, and I think there's many people who believe that just there's nothing the central banks can do to, to, to squash inflation. I actually think that's wrong. I think they could cause a depression, which would which would put a put a damper on inflation. Now, I don't think that they can engineer a soft landing. 
Um, but I think that's what could happen at the end of kind of Q, again, Q1, Q2. I think we could get some deflationary pressures coming through the, the markets due to the, the, the rate hikes that central banks have been trying and we'll force them to U-turn. The biggest question I have, and to, to be really honest, I'm not sure how this plays off, is whether or not we can get one more cycle of QE of risk on before they have to kind of reset the whole system. You know, I could see a thing where, you know, we just have a couple, you know, maybe a, you know, things just go down from here and they, you know, a year from now they have to reset everything. But I could also see a scenario where we, you know, again, have a bad first half of 2023, they reverse everything. We get another QE cycle that takes us into, I don't know, 2024, the election, 2025. And yeah, and yeah, ex exactly. So, and, and I don't really know how that one plays out. I, I could see it kind of going either way. But ultimately, to your point, Tony, I think the central banks will have to reverse. It was funny, for several years, we were in a currency war where everybody was cutting their cutting rates to weaken their currency. Now, in the last couple of, you know, call it a year, they've been raising rates to kind of strengthen their currency to try to uh, fight against the inflationary pressure. So now the currency war is who can, who can out hawk the other one. Mm -hmm. um, it's all going to end in tears. <laughs> Sadly, I think you're Sadly. right. <laughs> Sadly. Speaking of tears, Tracy, as we oh, no. talk you about, cry? as we talk about difficulties, every day uh, recession no. <laughs> and consumption, and Cuppy started talking about oil uh, at the start and oil demand. Uh, you posted a chart about looking at oil demand uh, elasticity uh, and household savings. You know, as, as central banks take different actions, of course, that changes as stimulus you know, has stopped. If it doesn't come back on, there are changes to household savings, these sorts of things. So, you know, you posted a really interesting chart about um, household savings. And can you talk us through a little bit of that and a little bit around oil demand elasticity? Yeah, I, what I think, I think there is a misconception that um, when there is a, a recession, that oil demand suddenly falls off a cliff, right? Everybody has a very short memory and they look at COVID and when we literally shut down the planet, but that's not the reality. So if you look at past recessions, in general, um, 2008, the most recent one, great financial crisis. Now we did see uh, a dip in demand, but it was only about 2%. And it was only about 2% for two quarters. And then by the third quarter, Demand increased higher over what it was before the great financial crisis. And so when I talk about the fact that, you know, everybody talks about savings rates are going down, credit card rates are going up, nobody's going to be able to afford oil, everything's going to shut down. There's a lot of fears running around, we're going to have this global recession and nobody's going to use oil anymore. And that's kind of been the prevailing narrative. And we've seen this in open interest. We've seen many uh, funds sort of lose interest over the oil. It's been a great year for them. They, you know, shed their positions. Um, but this prevailing narrative that we keep hearing in the media, oh, it's a global recession, everybody's, nobody's going to use oil again, is just not a fact. If we look at the data, if we look at every recession, recessionary pressures really have not taken much demand off the market. And every time that demand has been taken off the market, within a very relatively short period of time, we've seen demand increase over that prior level. And right. so to use this kind of as a narrative, uh, I, I think is is not correct if you actually look at the data. Okay, so we had this weird kind of almost recalibration of expectations with COVID where really everything came to a stop, right? right. So demand just cratered compared to say 2008, 2009 crisis. And so kind of the base effect of demand coming back has been really impressive kind of year on year growth each time, right? But, and, and then we'll continue to see that as China comes back. But there are some real concerns, for example, China's population peaks out, peaked out in 2022 or 23 or something like that, right? So their population's peaked out and it's all downside from here, right? Um, unless there's real growth in their consumption. Europe's pretty peaked out, Japan's peaked out, the US hasn't peaked out, but but we have some of those long-term trends and we have a recession. I'm just trying to play a little bit of devil's advocate here. 
How much of an impact do you think those have on um, on the on consumption uh, on the consumption dynamics, particularly with regard to savings and how if people aren't don't have rising incomes and their saving rates decline just to make ends meet, which wasn't necessarily the case in say 2010-11, um, can all of those things come together to really impact kind of the overall consumption trend? Or is that just not really a concern? Well, I think there's two separate things. If we're talking about declining pop population rates, um, you know, that's a, sort of a long-term view, you mm -hmm. know, we're looking 20, 50 years out, you know, does that trend continue? And of course, at, at that point, you're talking about global energy consumption decelerating, obviously. And we'll have nuclear powered flying cars, right? By then. So, so it's all going to be yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but if we talk about, you know, shorter term things or nearer term things, things that we're looking at, you know, over the next, say, you know, year to five years to 10 years, mm -hmm. I mean, there are still, regardless of um, a recession, we still are seeing year to year um, global consumption increasing. And we, in fact, we just had IEA, which I know is a WEF shill, but we just had them completely revise their whole, you know, global oil growth demand system going back to 2014. They redid their entire numbers yep. and added millions of barrels, right? Yep. And so, and, and the media really likes to use that IEA data. They just repackage it and whatever. And they've been completely wrong, you know, at that point. And, you know, this goes back to when we had missing barrels and everybody was talking about that back in 2014. Um, but the fact is, is that by any measure, global consumption is rising, right? And because you still have emerging markets yep. that are trying to get out of the darkness <laughs> you still yeah. have when you look at you know countries like india which you know they've had the strongest global demand increases so far this year yeah. and so there is always demand coming from somewhere and the problem always goes back to supply yeah. the fact is we just don't have the supply catching up with the demand so even if we look at the western world and even perhaps china you know years out i mean we still have to understand they're still increasing demand even though they're absolutely you know yeah. even if their population is elderly and declining there's their consumption um energy wise is still on the uptrend yeah. so we still have these huge markets that are still on an uptrend. You know, we're going to see this in emerging markets. We're going to see this in India. We're going to see this in uh, South America. We're going to see this in Africa in particular, because BRI, suddenly they got a, a lot of money from China. And they can build out this infrastructure and they, you know, they need, there is more demand there. So even though the West may be looking towards this green energy transition, we have to realize that that green energy transition also has not been working out. We just saw the biggest increase in coal demand in the EU in 10 years this year. Yes. Incredible, no. right? Just that energy policy is not- It borders on sarcasm. So the green energy transition, it borders on sarcasm. So- right. And so uh, really what, what we have to boil this all down to, the long and short of, I, I know I always- talking like broad picture, but really it all boils down to the data. Yeah. What is the supply coming online? What is the demand going forward? And so far, demand outstrips supply. Yeah. And there is no way around that right now. Okay. And it's fairly inelastic, it sounds like. And it is fairly inelastic. Okay. Even if you have, you know, again, look at the data. Anytime we've had a recession, demand is bounced back very quickly, and we've only seen a one to two percent pullback in demand. It's not yep. like COVID where everything crashed. Yep. Okay, so we started and ended with crude, but and I usually finish up, guys, with kind of what do you see for the week ahead. But I'm going to change it up a little bit. Go as we go into 2023 with regard to markets. What keeps you up at night? 
Like, what is that thing that you think about and you're like, well, account, nobody else sees this and it's obvious to me. What is that thing that keeps you up at night, Cuppy? I know you've got some amazing things in there. So <laughs> what is that thing? And I know none of us see what you see. You can't say bourbon. That's, <laughs> that's, right. that's not a legitimate answer. I, I think um, next year is the year that oil matters. Um, you know, we've lived in this world where oil has been sort of range bound really for uh, eight years. Um, and people just got used to energy being cheap. I mean, we had a little bit of an energy scare in Europe. And I say little because that should have been the wake up call. And, you know, instead, I think you're about to see the big one. Um, and you're going to see energy as a percentage of GDP to go to some crazy level like in the 1970s. And I think a as a result, most of the Q-SIPs on my screen are going to get smashed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everyone's worried about j -Pow. But in the end, j is not the world's central banker. Oil is. And j is going to chase oil higher on the screen for a while. He effectively has been chasing oil higher on the screen. And, and you know, when oil roll, rolled over from the summer onwards, that's what cooled off the inflation. Uh, it's not Fed funds rate, but that kind of helps. It, it's really just oil. And as oil reaccelerates, j is going to chase it higher on the screen. And it's going to get to a price where he's going to have a dilemma. He could either keep chasing oil higher or he could bail out the real economy or the rest of the economy. And I think he's going to bail out the rest of the economy by cutting rates and setting oil parabolic. And mm. I, I think that's how you get to my 300 number. And I, I don't think people realize that, you know, oil at 90, who cares? Oil got to 120 for a couple of weeks this summer. Who cares? I mean, what if oil is consistently in the high 100s and it just stays there? I think it just dramatically changes uh, the, the arithmetic for every other QSIP on the screen. Absolutely. People aren't plugging that in. Yep. Okay, good. Thank you. Tracy, what keeps you up at night? So, well, I, I actually think that, I mean, looking at 2024, I think that the metals markets are going to make a huge comeback. Not, I, I'm not talking precious metals. I'm talking base and industrial metals. Only because I think that oil plays a part in that. And if we have higher oil prices, we're going to have higher metals prices. And because the West, in particular, the EU does not seem to want to be giving up on this EU, this green energy policy, we're going to need a lot of metals. We're going to need a lot of copper, we're going to need cobalt, nickel, whatever, if they want to continue down this path. Sorry, you're saying you need more industrial metals for batteries and other infrastructure for the green uh, transition? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. More more than the, than we're currently <clears throat> produced. In fact, we don't even have the reserve. We don't even have the known reserves to get to the 2030 goals right now. If we're talking about copper and whatever, and certainly the the mining industry has suffered the same problem as the oil industry has a lack of capex for the last seven years, and so we simply just don't have that. So what I'm looking at, you know, I think that. Oil was a big story and will continue to be a big story in you know, 2021, 2022, but I think metals are going to start to come into play in 2023 and 2024. And what I'm worried about is we literally don't have, again, no CapEx, and um, we don't even have proven reserves anywhere. <laughs> so, okay. um, so that's what I, wor I worry about, that the metals based in industrial metals. Okay, so, so far it's commodities keeping you guys up at night. Brent, <laughs> wrap us up. What keeps you well, up? Well, so it, it's kind of interesting. Um, I think that the underappreciated risk, even though the dollar made a hell of a run this year, is that we could have a funding market problem in the euro dollar market. And uh, to be honest, it doesn't keep me up at night because I'm kind of ready for it. I'm expecting it. Um, to, you know what keeps me up at night? Is, is, is these guys in Washington and, you know, Frankfurt and D.C. and Tokyo and Beijing figuring out how to extend this game because they're, they're masters at keeping the plate spinning. And I'm always trying to figure out what are they going to do next to keep this whole house of cards going? And to me, that's the wild card. You know, I, I feel like I can kind of figure out markets. If markets are just left alone, I can kind of figure them out. The wild card is when is when the masters of the universe or the powers that be, however you want to describe them, come in and start messing with things because, you know, that, that that can change things at least for a day or a week or a month. And, you know, sometimes that's enough to wipe you out. Yep. Okay. Guys, thank you so much. This has been really enlightening. I really appreciate the thought you put into this. I want to wish you all the best for the holidays and a fantastic 2023. Thank you so much. Happy holidays, everybody. Happy holidays. Sure.